Hi everyone, welcome back. Uh, this is Earth and Space Science. Uh, we're doing lecture 13 today. Lecture 13 is going to be a continuation of talking about oceans, but this time we're going to restrict the conversation to the coastlines and the part of the seafloor that's near the coastlines. So in this lecture, I'm not so concerned with the water on Earth. We're mainly going to be concerned with the, um, the effect that that water has on the coastlines and the, the shape of coastlines worldwide. So the first thing that we have to do is sort of keep reminding ourselves that plate tectonics is driving everything. Plate tectonics is going to be really sort of crucial in this, this whole process. Um, particularly when you're talking about the shape of the ocean floor, um, it's almost entirely driven by plate tectonics and uh, sedimentation coming from the continents. So when we look at the, uh, the coastlines, the best thing to start off with is a little bit of a conversation about these things called continental margins. So the kind of um, image that I want you to kind of come up with is putting on a scuba set and a pair of lead boots and essentially sort of just walking out into the ocean and kind of trying to get an idea of thinking about what the ocean floor is really going to look like. It would be really easy to think that it's just kind of a gradual decline all the way out to the middle of the oceans, you know, like a big basin. Um, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. The continental margins are going to be entirely defined by what's going on with plate tectonics. We're going to have these things called active and passive continental margins. So essentially in an active continental margin, if you're doing that march out into the oceans in your lead boots, um, you would experience a really, really rapid drop off that wouldn't essentially occur if you were talking about a passive continental margin. Um, passive continental margins would be a little bit more of a, a gradual decline out into the middle of the oceans, with, with a couple of exceptions. There are going to be some features in the continental margins that are going to be the same, um, or at least similar, whether you're talking about an active or a passive continental margin. So for our purposes, let's define continental margin as the entire ocean floor ranging from the point of the coastline, so where the ocean meets the land, um, out to the flat part of the ocean that we're calling the abyssal plain. The abyssal plain is just going to be sort of the boring part of the ocean that's not going to be as heavily determined by the plate tectonic cycle. Everything in between, including the continental shelf, the slope, the rise, and potentially the oceanic trench, if it's an active margin, um, that's all going to be part of the continental margin. So in a passive continental margin, um, we don't see the trench. Um, and a great example of what a passive continental margin uh, would look like would be something like uh, the Gulf of Mexico coastline, the eastern seaboard of the United States, places where two separate plate tectonic pieces or plates are not meeting. Instead, you just have all the sediment coming off of the continent, eventually coming to rest on the seafloor, gradually trailing off to the, uh, the, the, the deeper part of the ocean, the abyssal plain. So you have a shelf, a slope, a rise, and then the abyssal plain. Um, in an active continental margin, the difference is going to be that it's overall going to be a lot more narrow. The entire margin is going to be maybe half of the overall width that uh, you would have in a passive continental margin. And then that sediment that does get off of the continent is going to pile up sort of really rapidly, and then the seafloor is going to drop off really rapidly, extending down to the oceanic trench. Keep in mind that where you have an active continental margin, that's where you have an active plate boundary. In this case, mainly it's going to be a convergent plate boundary. So what's happening at a convergent plate boundary, just to recap from previous lectures, is when you have oceanic crust, that oceanic crust has to subduct beneath something else, in this case, a continent. So the oceanic crust is dense and heavy and thin. The, uh, the continent is going to be light and buoyant, um, a, a lot thicker overall, and the oceanic crust is going to sink down. Wherever it sinks down, that's where the V is going to be on the ocean floor, the deep part of the ocean floor. Um, and it's actually going to be deeper right there, right adjacent to the continent than it is out in the deep sort of middle part of the ocean. So, for instance, in the Pacific, the deepest part of the Pacific is fairly close to the Asian continent, and it's not, and it's not just out in the middle of the ocean somewhere. 
So that oceanic trench is going to be really sort of part of the continental margin, in this case, part of an active continental margin only. So the west coast of the United States is a great example of what an active continental margin looks like, because especially in the northwest part of the, uh, um, that coastline, in places like Oregon and Washington and Northern California, you have subduction going on. Wherever you have subduction, you have a trench. You have much deeper water overall. So let's look at this piece by piece, and I'll remind you which parts of these are going to be the same between an active and a passive continental margin, and which one of these are going to be different. In an active and a passive continental margin, you have at the first part, it's going to extend from the actual coastline itself, uh, where the water's meeting the land, out to the point when the sea level is going to drop off really rapidly. Um, this is going to be called the shelf. So much like a, a windowsill or a bookshelf, it's going to be this sort of vaguely flat, maybe slightly sloping part of the seafloor extending away from the coastline. Um, and so most of the part of the coastline that's right up against the actual edge of the continent is still pretty shallow compared to the deeper parts of the ocean that's thousands of feet deep. You might only have a depth of a few hundred feet along the entire continental shelf. The reason why the continental shelf exists is it represents what the continents would look like if sea level were different. And the thing that most substantially changes sea level is going to be variations in global temperatures on Earth. When temperatures are lower, um, like during an ice age, then worldwide sea level is going to be a much, uh, at a much lower point because the water doesn't take up as much space when the water is colder um, and a lot more of that water is going to be locked up in the form of ice. So that edge of the continent at the shelf is actually what the edge of the continent would look like if sea level were much lower. Um, in future lectures, when we talk about ice ages and glaciers, I'll show you some maps of what uh, North America particularly would look like during an ice age compared to what it looks like now. And you get an idea of the importance of the continental shelf as representing sea level's low stand. So essentially, you've got that flat part of the coastline, and then the edge of it is essentially sort of the true edge of the continent. Then you drop off really rapidly. And both in active and passive continental margins, the next thing that you see is the continental slope. So it's maybe a little bit steeper, a little bit more rapid, a little bit more narrow overall in an active continental margin, maybe a little bit longer, uh, wider uh, in a... Um, in a passive continental margin, uh, but they're essentially going to be similar features. They're both called continental slopes in both types of continental margins. And this is going to essentially just represent sort of the true edge of the continental landmass. At the bottom of the continental landmass, that's where things are going to be different depending on whether it's an active or passive continental margin. Let's first start with what happens in a passive margin. Remember, there's no plate tectonics, there's no subduction, there's none of this action that's forcing this trench to occur. So what occurs is that you get the sediment that will eventually sort of make its way all the way off to the end of the slope and pile up at the bottom of the slope. That creates something called the continental rise. That's basically sort of a little sort a gradual hill at the bottom of that slope. Um, and only the really fine grain sediment's going to make it out that far. Um, so you don't really get really coarse sediment like sand and gravel that far away from the continent. It's all that really fine grain mud and clay that makes it out that far. Um, and then at the bottom of that slope, you reach the abyssal plain. And the abyssal plain, remember, is whether or not you're talking about uh, active or con uh, passive continental margin, it's going to basically just be that flat part of the ocean floor um, that's not going to relate in any way to continental processes anymore. The oceanic trench is going to be what forms at that place where the slope was if you're dealing with an active continental margin. Because in that case, again, you've got subduction occurring, where you have subduction occurring, you've got the V on the ocean floor, and that's going to be the deepest part of the ocean floor, deeper than the abyssal plain. 
And so you almost always have some type of volcanic activity associated with that trench. They kind of go hand in hand together. They maybe aren't right next to each other. Um, you know, they're not like a mile away from each other or on the surface of the earth. But for instance, where you have the Mariana Trench, you have the Mariana Islands, you have the volcanic activity associated with the formation of those islands. The volcanic activity is essentially sort of why those islands exist in the first place. So the important distinction, remember, between the active and passive continental margins is mainly the slope and the passive margin, because you don't have plate tectonics. And in the active continental margin, that's replaced by the trench, because you, that actually represents the plate boundary itself. Now, our next feature that we're going to talk about on the ocean floor isn't related to the continents and the plate boundary at the continents at all. Instead, this is going to relate to a different plate boundary that it can exist out in the middle of the oceans. For example, out in the middle of the Atlantic, we have one of these features. It's a mid-ocean ridge. So the mid-ocean ridges represent um, the divergent plate boundaries in the same way that the trench and the volcanic activity represents the convergent plate boundaries. The mid-ocean ridges essentially are your spreading points for the plate boundaries on Earth. That's where the plates are going to split apart and new material is created in the gap. Now, this is what where everybody always sort of wants to think this is where the trench is going to be. This is where the deep point on Earth is going to be. But what's really happening at the mid-ocean ridge is all of this new rock that's being created, where all this magma is rising up to the surface, it's going to be light and buoyant and new, and it's going to form essentially underwater volcanic mountain ranges. So it is a ridge, it is essentially an underwater mountain range that is going to mark the divergent plate boundaries on Earth and does in fact mark the mid-Atlantic ridge from almost pole to pole. Now right down the middle of this sort of, in a sense, sort of underwater mountain range is this tiny little V at the top, the Rift Valley. And that's representing the actual splitting point between those two continents. It's a tiny, tiny little um, V up at the very top of these mountains underwater. That's where all of this really cool activity is going on. The geothermal activity, the introduction of all of those salts when all of that hot water makes its way back out into the oceans. And it's even thought that these environments could be where life originated on Earth. Um, chemosynthetic organisms sort of just eking out an existence on these black smokers and all of this hydrothermal activity at the floor of the ocean. This, this could be the origin of, of life on Earth. Uh, life maybe didn't originate closer to the surface. It's a theory anyway. So the next thing that we're going to talk about is the sediment that is going to populate these regions, because especially over long periods of time, uh, the amount of sediment that you're going to get is going to be determined by your proximity to the continents. The continents are, in a sense, always sort of shedding off skin. They're always um, uh, eroding off sediment, and that sediment's always moving out into the margins and moving out to the edges of the continents. Um, where that sediment ends up is mainly a function of its, its grain size, because heavier sediment like sand and gravel can't make its way out into the deep oceans, but sometimes some of the fine grain sediment can. The sediment that populates the continental margins, so that's the shelf, the slope, the rise, or even sometimes the sediment that makes its way down to the bottoms of the oceanic trenches, is all derived from the continents. So we call it terrigenous sediment, in the same way that you and I are terrestrial organisms. We are organisms that live on the continents on Earth itself. The terra is essentially the root for all of this activity taking place on the continents. So terrigenous sediment sediment is sediment originating from the continents. It's all mainly siliciclastic stuff. That means uh, stuff that's rich in silicon and oxygen, sand, gravel, clay, mud that's moving off the continents and onto the seafloor. As you move further and further and further out to sea, the amount of energy that it takes to move that sediment is greater and greater, and you don't have that energy anymore. Therefore, the grain size keeps decreasing out to sea.
and the amount of sediment that ultimately makes its way to the ocean floor decreases it as well. And so you don't really get these nice sort of uniform thickness um, sedimentary deposits. You get these sedimentary deposits that sort of thin out as they make their way out into the oceans. Finally, that sediment is replaced by sediment that we call pelagic sediment. Pelagic sediment is sediment that's originating from the oceans itself. So it's stuff like uh, chalk and chert, um, uh, sometimes a little bit of windblown clay coming from the continents, but able to move across the entire oceans. Um, so it's very, very, very... Uh, um, slow rates of sedimentation that ultimately make their way onto the seafloor and then pile up down there. Uh, so the stuff like chalk and the chert, for instance, are, are both derived from the organisms that actually live in the oceans. When these organisms die, things like uh, diatoms, radiolarins, foriams, all of these organisms that secrete these mineral-rich shells, they all die and they fall down to the bottom of the ocean. They pile up at the floor of the ocean down there, and they are a big component of pelagic sediment. So that sediment, whether you're at the continental margin or you're a little bit closer to the mid-ocean ridges and out into the abyssal plain, is going to make up a very, very thin crust, a very, maybe crust is a bad word, maybe a thin veneer on the floor of the ocean where the underlying material is mainly going to be igneous in origin. It's going to be things like um, basalt and at greater depths, gabbro. Finally, at the base of the oceanic crust and the top of the mantle, um, that igneous rock is going to be replaced by ultramafic igneous rock. Uh, this is going to be essentially all the stuff that's making up the mantle itself. It's going to be ultra-dense, very heavy rock. But the stuff that's actually making up the ocean floor, this is mainly, especially getting closer to the surface, going to be uh, formed at the mid-ocean ridge, so it's going to be um, extrusive in origin. Okay, so that's going to sort of wrap up our uh, little talk about the rock of the, uh, the crust on the floor of the ocean, um, the difference between the continental margins and the abyssal plain, all that stuff out in the deep ocean. The rest of this lecture is going to be dedicated to the coastlines themselves and all of the various interesting processes that are going to shape the coastlines. So for our definition, uh, we're going to call the coast all the land near the oceans or near the sea, including the beach and the land just inside the beach. Um, so everything within, you know, let, let's call it maybe like a half a mile of the beach. That's going to be the coast. And so by this definition, um, a big chunk of South Louisiana is going to be coastal. Places like uh, Biloxi Beach and Pensacola, these are all going to be coastal areas. And coastal areas are mainly going to be driven by geological processes that stem from the oceans themselves. So we're going to talk about three things that are going to um, shape, uh, they're going to create and uh, define what the coastlines ultimately look like. Um, these three things are going to be the source of sediment, waves, and tides. So the first of these three that we're going to talk about is where the sediment comes in that actually builds these coastlines. The source of sediment for most of our coastlines in the Gulf Coast area, Louisiana in particular, is going to be river-derived sediment. So this is essentially how you build beaches, how you build any sort of coastal environment is influx of sediment from rivers. I can't think of a more... Um, a place in the world that's more important for this idea than South Louisiana, where most of our, um, in the, in the entirety of South Louisiana is derived from sediment from the Mississippi River. So the source of sediment for places that we're going to call depositional coastlines and the Gulf Coast in its entirety is a great example of a depositional coastline is river-derived sediments. But in other places of the world, it's going to be erosion that really drives um, the, the sedimentation there. It's going to be erosion of rock that's right there at the beach. And if you have rock at the beach, rock that's not displaced but actual um, uh, uh, connected 
unprotected basement rock, then it's going to be a place that's a lot more tectonically active than we are down here. It's going to be a place like, take for instance, um, San Francisco, most of the West Coast, even parts of the, uh, the Northeast Coast of the United States, places like Maine, places where you have these big cliffs overlooking the ocean and all of this rock jetting out into the sea. Those rocks and the erosion of that, those rocks are going to provide the source of sediment that then later builds um, the beaches and builds parts of the coastline. So the source of sediment is really important for, uh, for coastlines in general. Um, the second thing that we're going to talk about, the second factor that is going to create and influence coastlines uh, is the effect of tides. Now, um, first and foremost, tides occur on Earth because of the gravitational relationship between three big objects in our solar system. That's the Earth itself, the moon, and the sun. Um, the moon is really only going to be a big factor on Earth just because it's parked right next to us. It's locked in orbit around Earth. So, of course, it's going to have a strong gravitational relationship with the Earth. The sun is going to be important because it contains 99.9% .9 of the mass of our entire solar system. So, of course, the sun is going to pull hard on Earth's water. So at various times during the day and during the month when these factors all line up together, they can have a really substantial effect on displacing the water on Earth. So what happens here is particularly, let's ignore the sun for a second, just look at the effect of the moon. As the moon orbits around Earth and, uh, you know, as the Earth rotates, the Earth essentially is going to experience this displacement of water on Earth to be pulled in the direction of these other objects that are pulling on the Earth itself and, and displacing the water on the Earth, the objects that are having the gravitational relationship with Earth. If we're just focusing on the moon for a second, then essentially wherever the moon is, that's going to be where water on Earth is going to be pulled towards. Then the secondary effect of having the Earth actually rotate while this is occurring is going to create this thing called a tidal bulge around the Earth. So the water isn't just essentially pulled only in the direction of the moon, it's pulled towards the other direction on Earth as well. Then the Earth is rotating through this tidal ellipse or tidal bulge, and as it does so, we experience a high tide, low tide, high tide, low tide, in some cases, multiple high tides and multiple low tides per day, in some cases, only one high tide and one low tide per day. So let's look at an idealized example of this to understand it a little bit better. In this picture, you're looking at the Earth from the perspective of the North Pole. And to simplify things, there's going to just be one giant island on Earth. And there aren't going to be all of these messy subcontinents and so on, just one big island. And we're looking at it at various points during the day. Also part of this picture is the position of the moon. The moon, if you kind of line up the moon with this diagram of Earth, you see that the water is existing, it's in a bulge on either side of the Earth in that same line as the moon. And again, that's because the Earth is rotating. So as we rotate, if the, the island in this case is going to be directly located under the moon, um, if the moon is directly above in the sky, then that means that it's experiencing the effect of this tidal ellipse, and this is high tide. Let's say this is only going to be, it's going to be a very, um, this, this island doesn't have a lot of elevation, so it's going to be a fairly shallow island. So it's completely submerged at high tide. Later on, six hours later, after the Earth continues to rotate, we have rotated out of that tidal bulge, or that little island has essentially rotated out of that tidal bulge. So now we're at low tide. Six hours later still, we're at high tide again. And six hours after that, we're at low tide again. And as we go another six hours, we've completed a whole 24-hour cycle, and we're back to high tide. So some places really do experience tides like that. Um, they're called um, uh, diurnal tides, where we have essentially two high tides and two low tides a day. Some places, because of the shape of the ocean basin, because of a lot of other complexities that we're not going to get into, only experience the one high tide and the one low tide per day. So they have semi-diurnal tides. 
So the important thing to remember here is that Earth is rotating through that tidal ellipse. That's essentially why we're experiencing high tides and low tides. Not necessarily because of the moon itself. The moon is why the tidal ellipse exists. The reason why we have that variation between high tide and low tide is because of the Earth's rotation. Okay, so now let's kind of unfold all of this because it gets kind of complicated and go back to the root thing that we're trying to understand, which is how the shape of coastlines are determined. The extent to which tides play a factor is going to be dependent on the fluctuation between how high high tide is and how low the low tide is. If you have a huge variation between the, the two, you essentially have a much wider overall coastline. Your coastline is going to exist much further inland than it would have otherwise. There are rivers in, um, in Europe where you have the effect of tides that can be felt for two or three miles inland. So the water level in the river actually increases during high tide miles and miles inland and then decreases again. In other places on Earth, we don't have that effect so much because we have only sort of moderate tides. And the Gulf of Mexico is a good example of where we only have sort of a mild effect of tides. So our variation between high tide and low tide is actually very small. Wherever the tide is at that particular time, that is the exact line or place of your coastline. Wherever the total variation is, that is the extent of your um, uh, range of coastline. Uh, so that's, that's the an entire place where the coast could exist at any given point in time. There are also monthly tidal cycles that we're not going to get into, but that involves having an even greater range of variation in where the tide is going to exist. So the last thing that we're going to talk about that's going to play a role in coastlines is probably the most important because this is the one that's actually going to take sediment that's at one point in the coastline and move it around. It's going to do the actual erosion of coastlines and the deposition of coastline. It's going to actually move sediment. This is going to be waves. So when you actually start looking for like the, the root cause of waves, it's all to do with wind. So as a kind of thought experiment, let's say we just sort of immediately snap our fingers and remove the atmosphere on Earth. We no longer have any atmosphere, just for the purposes of this example. If we didn't have an atmosphere, we wouldn't have wind, because wind is just moving air. And if we didn't have wind, then all of the waves in the oceans would just cease to exist. The oceans would become very, very calm all of a sudden. It's because the wind moving over the water is actually transferring some of its energy to the water. So that moving air is moving over the water, it's moving some of its energy into the water, and then that causes these sort of cyclical patterns to occur inside, in the, um, in the water column itself, these elliptical patterns to occur. Then when those same patterns and that same energy of that moving energy through the water reaches the shoreline, it moves to where it can actually um, it can actually break upon the shoreline and churn up sediment. And so the surf uh, right next to the, the coastline itself is all going to be caused because the, uh, uh, the sea level depth is going to be much lower at the coastline. So all that energy gets to sort of eventually spend itself on moving around sediment on the coastline itself. So there's going to be um, a few main factors that is going to determine the height of waves. And this is something that if you spend any amount of time in the ocean, if you spend any amount of time on the beach, you sort of already inherently know. Um, even if you just maybe watch movies, you know that people don't do a whole lot of extreme surfing in the Gulf of Mexico. People aren't really looking for 10 to 14 foot waves in the Gulf of Mexico. And the main reason for that is the Gulf of Mexico is a small basin. There's only a limited amount of space for the wind to move across the water. If you're looking for big waves, you typically go to somewhere in the Pacific Basin. You think of some place like Hawaii or Southern California. That's where you're going to have much, much taller waves. So the height of the waves is mainly determined by wind speed, length of time the wind blows. Those two things can actually vary. So in given circumstances, you, you can actually um, hypothetically have big waves in the Gulf of Mexico. It just takes high wind speeds. So we need a landfalling hurricane to have surfable waves in the Gulf of Mexico.
Then the most important thing that doesn't vary so much with time, but only varies with place, is the distance that the wind blows over the water. That's called fetch. So with a greater fetch, a greater distance that the wind can blow over the water, you can generate bigger waves. So basically, you know, to kind of rank it, you have bigger waves in Lake Pontchartrain than you do in a pond in your backyard. For the same reason that you have bigger waves in the Gulf of Mexico than you do in Lake Pontchartrain. For the same reason that you have bigger waves in the Pacific than you do in the Gulf of Mexico. It's all a question of the distance that the wind can then blow over the water. So as the waves are out in deep water, they typically just have a very sort of gradual swell. They don't actually create sort of white water. They don't um, uh, crest and, and break as surf. It's when those waves move to the shoreline that they actually uh, eventually break and then spend themselves and spend that energy in redistributing sediment. So the next thing that we're going to look at is how the waves actually redistribute sediment, because this part's really interesting. This part's where um, you can eventually kind of get the idea of how the sediment from one place on Earth, like the mouth of a river, gets relocated miles and miles away from the mouth of the river to build out the coastlines. Without the effect of waves, um, coastlines would look a lot more jagged and irregular. They wouldn't be as flat and smooth on a world map as they truly are. And most of that's, again, due to waves. So the way that this works is essentially that waves hardly ever come in perfectly um, perpendicular to the coastline itself. Like let's say you have first a coastline, and then if you had the waves coming in perfectly perpendicular to the coastline. That's the direction that they're traveling. So these waves themselves are actually parallel to the coastline. Um, if that happened, then the waves would spin themselves, taking sediment, pushing it up the beach, and then back down the beach again. But that's not what really happens. Waves typically are going to come in at an angle. So if, let's say, here's your coastline, and then you've got waves coming in at an angle, those waves coming in at an angle take sediment, move it up and down the beach, but always in this direction that's ultimately going to be along the beach itself. So the mode in which the sediment is actually going to travel is going to be along the beach or down the beach. So it's all about having these waves come in at an angle, take sediment, move it up and down the beach, but ultimately moving it along the beach that drives sediment transportation. The current that's getting created here that's moving essentially down the beach is called a longshore current. And the sediment moving up and down the beach is called the longshore drift. The drift is the drift of the sediment. The current is actually the movement of the water. And both are moving in one direction or another along the beach. So, you know, to kind of put this in sort of a real world sense to, to kind of give you uh, an idea of what this really sort of feels like, I'm sure many of you have been to the beach before and you'll set up, let's say, an umbrella and a cooler and put your shoes on one part of the beach and you get it far enough away from the waves that it's not going to be a problem. And then you go out and you go play in the water. So you're splashing around, you're not really paying a whole lot of attention, you look back at the beach and then you find out that you're maybe 20, 30 feet down from where you started. And that's because without you really knowing it, the longshore current has been pushing you along, almost like water in a river is pushing you along. But in this case, it's pushing you along the beach itself. So whatever direction you got pushed by these waves, um, that's the same direction that the sediment's going to get pushed and the same direction that the barrier islands are going to build or the, um, uh, the, the, the beach itself uh, adjacent to the continent, the direction that that sediment's going to move. It's all going to be dependent upon the longshore current and the longshore drift. Uh, another thing that's going to be dependent upon the longshore current are these things called rip currents. So let's say you have two competing longshore currents, and they're moving along the beach, and they're moving towards each other. So you have waves coming in at an angle from one direction, and then you have some more waves coming in in another direction. That sets up these competing longshore currents that then meet in the middle. Then the only thing that's going to happen with that water is that it's got to go somewhere, and it's a lot of water meeting up at one point, so it then moves back out to sea. But it moves at maybe twice the pace or three times the pace that most of the water is retreating back out to sea. 
that's called a rip current or in some cases a rip tide. And it can be really dangerous to get caught up in these rip currents or rip tides because sometimes they that water might be moving so fast that you can't swim fast enough to then swim back to the beach. You get flushed out to sea along with all of the sediment and all of this water. So what you would do in that situation is don't try to swim towards the beach. You then swim parallel to the beach until you get out of that rip current. Then you can a little bit more easily make your way back onto land. Um, the last thing that we're going to talk about with this lecture is going to be some different types of coastlines and how they're dependent upon the plate tectonic cycle and the source of sediment that is, again, going to be dependent upon that plate tectonic cycle. Um, so we're going to look at erosional and depositional coasts. Then we're going to look at another way of sort of classifying coastlines, and that's going to be as either emergent or submergent coastlines. So first, let's look at erosional coastlines. And this is going to be a little bit more abstract for us because this isn't what the Gulf Coast looks like at all. You don't go to a place like Grand Isle or Biloxi Beach and expect there to be this, uh, this cliff overlooking the ocean. You know, you expect uh, a lot of mud, a lot of sand, vaguely kind of eventually tapering off into the Gulf of Mexico because we exist on a depositional coastline. In an erosional style coastline, you have all of these mountains adjacent to the coast itself. And it's all, again, dependent upon plate tectonics. Uh, the, the oceanic crust is subducting underneath the continent, causing this uplift. So imagine places like um, uh, the West Coast, uh, Southern California, and all of these multi-million dollar homes overlooking these wonderful vistas of the Pacific Ocean. Um, so all of this is going to take place on uplifted uh, the places, but they're extremely vulnerable to the processes of erosion because especially these um, uh, parts of the coastline that are jutting out into the ocean are almost like targets for the erosive power of waves because from all directions, these waves are going to come in and erode back those um uh, it, it, all of these um, um, inlets coming out into the ocean, all of that uh, rock is going to be very quickly eroded back. The rock itself is going to be the source of sediment for these coastlines. So then all that sediment ultimately has to go somewhere. And it doesn't just get flushed back out into the ocean to settle in deep water. It stays relatively close to the coastline itself. All the sediment that had been eroded from those rocky headlands gets eroded back into the bays. So the headlands essentially used to be the mountains. The bays used to be the valleys. But these headlands have been eroded back to form cliffs. And all that sediment ends up populating the bays. So what happens? after a while is that coastal straightening occurs, which when you think about it, it's way, what waves are ultimately doing in any environment, in um, erosional or depositional coast. They're straightening or flattening out the coastline. In this case, in an erosional style coastline, it's happening because the rocky headlands are being eroded and they're being eroded back. The bays are being built out and then you end up with a flatter overall coast overall. In a depositional style coastline, like in South Louisiana or the entire Gulf Coast, your source of sediment is river sediment. And you have a lot more sediment, maybe two or three times as much sediment coming in from rivers and streams as you do in erosional style coastlines. So all of the sediment ultimately has to go somewhere. So it builds out the coastline, it builds along the coastline, and it can even end up out to sea forming these things called barrier islands. Barrier islands are essentially just like giant sandbars. They're built on shifting piles of sediment where this sediment is eventually kind of moving its way back towards the continent itself, and then a new barrier island is going to take its place. So over the course of 10 years, 100 years, even multiple human lifetimes, a barrier island might seem like it's not really moving around, like it's not going to change its position. But over longer periods of time, a couple hundred years, a thousand years, the barrier islands can very quickly be destroyed, especially when you factor in big catastrophic, catastrophic events like hurricanes. 
So depositional coastlines are really characterized by all of these things, uh, river-derived uh, sediment, um, barrier islands, uh, barrier islands like Grand Isle, um, Santa Rosa Island, where um, Pensacola Beach and Navarre Beach is in Florida, um, all, all of the, essentially all of the islands in the, the northern Gulf of Mexico, they're all essentially barrier islands. Um, they're going to be sort of classic hallmark, hallmark features that you really only get in depositional coastlines where you have a tremendous amount of sediment coming in. So um, the other way that we can go about classifying coastlines is either as submergent or emergent features. So to submerge is to go back under the water, to emerge is to come out of the water. And the submergent and emergent is really just a kind of going into this classification of coastlines that's dependent upon the forces of uplift versus the forces of um, submergence and, and the forces of, of, um, of erosion. Erosion. If you have a submergent coastline, then you have a coastline that's essentially sort of sinking. Parts of South Louisiana coastline are essentially sort of submergent parts of our coastline. It's really almost going to be almost anything except the act of Mississippi River Delta. All of the other parts of our coastline are pretty classic examples of submergent parts of our coastline. Um, the uh, emergent part of our coastline is, of course, the Mississippi River Delta itself. A place like Mobile Bay is a really great example of a submergent coastline because it is a river that has a drowned mouth. The mouth or the end of that river is uh, a place where seawater is moving in and the fresh water is moving in. So you get a little bit of brackish uh, environment. You get some mixing of seawater and freshwater salinities. And it's all happening because there's not enough sediment in the Mobile River to keep that coastline elevated and to even extend the coastline. So it's a recessional feature as opposed to something that's actually prograding out into the Gulf. So any estuary, like Mobile Bay, is a really good e e example of something that's going to only form in submergent coastlines. Emergent coastlines have to be elevated and continue to elevate. And the two factors that are going to cause elevation is going to be either uh, the plate tectonic cycle, uplift a associated with the plate tectonic cycle, or a lot of sediment coming into that environment, or for some reason something like a decrease in sea level. So uh, particularly in depositional style coastlines, the only places where you get um, emergent features are places like the mouth of the river, where you have a lot of sediment coming in, and the, the forces of the tidal action and the wave action aren't really enough to take that sediment and uh, redistribute it rapidly. So then that sediment ends up causing a continuation of the coastline where it progrades or it, it, it continues to form and extends itself out into um, the ocean, in this case, out into the Gulf of Mexico. All right, so that's going to wrap up um, coastlines and our two lectures on oceans. We're going to finish out this lecture by cutting to another little quick field trip. I hope you enjoy it. All right, so this is Fountain Blue State Park. So we're located just east of um, the city of Mandeville on the north shore of Lake Pontchartrain. And there are a couple of reasons why I wanted to do a live field trip here um, in the state park. Um, one of the, the biggest is this is just a great place to talk about some of the concepts that we already described in the lecture, the concepts of having a depositional style coastline and a submergent coastline and what that means broadly in South Louisiana. So um, in any depositional coastline, you have tributaries, um, rivers and, and bayous that are bringing sediment into the system. And in our case in Fountain Blue State Park, those main tributaries are the Chifuncta River to the west and Cane Bayou to the east. So they're bringing sand and they're bringing sediment into the system that, can, that then gets reworked along the lakefront. So then that sediment is moved along the lakefront by that longshore drift that we talked about earlier. Um, and, and continues to kind of uh, build out and smooth out the coastline. Now, the other thing that makes Fountain Blue State Park really interesting is that we have some other types of geology to look at here as well. Um, we've got some uh, soft sediment faults called Lystric uh, Normal Faults. 
Um, there's one actually that runs basically right along the lakefront itself. It starts as part of the broader Baton Rouge fault system and then it extends east all the way through cu cutting off sort of most of the North Shore and extends through Fountain Blue really just about right here. And so what that fault does is it allows everything south of the fault to sink down and everything north of the fault to basically sort of stay stable. And it's a big part of why Lake Pontchartrain is where it is, is because of that fault allowing for that land to actually sink down. The other thing that's really interesting about um, Lake Pontchartrain and then this area around Fountain Blue State Park is that most of Lake Pontchartrain actually used to be a delta lobe of the Mississippi River. So it used to be where the Mississippi River was dumping sediment and dumping water out into the Gulf of Mexico. So it actually built out stable land for a period of time until the Mississippi River changed paths. And so that's why the Lake Pontchartrain is really um, uh, fairly shallow. For most of the lake, the water depth isn't much greater than five feet. Um, so now between the natural subsidence of, subsidence of that sediment, now that the Mississippi River isn't actively feeding a ton of sediment into the system and through the fault that's running across the, um, the, the lakefront here, um, you have that sinking down and you actually have a lake in its place and not a stable land mass. So this is just what, some of the things that I wanted to show you here at the park. Until next time, keep rocking.